Hi everyone and welcome to our virtual service of worship on this day, Sunday the 26th of April. You may be watching this on Facebook or YouTube, or you may indeed be reading a printed copy that I'm sending to all those without internet access. But however you're engaged, I pray that you will feel connected with one another and also with God at this time. Come and walk with him. Come and talk with him. Come and feast with him. Come right now and worship Jesus, our risen Lord. Let's pray together. Loving God, our Heavenly Father, we gather today as your people, albeit in our own homes. We come to walk a journey together, to talk and to share along the way, to meet and to know Jesus. Lord Jesus, we come to share in your story. We come to feast with you. We approach your throne in the knowledge that you died for us and rose again. Help us to marvel at all that you have done for us. Amen. We're going to be focusing our attention today on the Gospel reading that is set for this Sunday, which is the account of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We're going to be exploring the things in our lives that are perhaps right in front of us, and yet we often fail to see them clearly. And this will lead us on to the three points we're going to look at in more detail, namely allowing God to open our eyes in order to see his glory. The fact that God can and does put a claim on anyone. And finally, with God, sometimes there is no logical explanation. But before we do any of this, we raise our voices to the Lord as we sing our faith together. Meet and right it is to sing in every time and place. We now bring our prayers to God, our prayers of praise and confession. Let's pray together. Risen Lord Jesus, our friend, our companion and our healer, as we walk the road in front of us, we pray that you will be by our side and never leave us. 
We come now to offer our worship and praise, for you invite us to walk the path that you have set. Help us to stay true to you and to walk that path of truth and of faith, enjoying those moments when we can walk and talk with you, when we can enjoy feasting in your presence and sharing your story with those we meet in order to make disciples and to grow the kingdom. Enable us, we pray, to share our own experience of the life and love we have discovered in you. When we are tired and weary and stop to rest, enable us to gain our refreshment in your love as we praise and worship you with our whole selves. But we also come, risen Lord, to say that we are sorry for the times when we fail to recognise you in our midst, when we are too preoccupied with ourselves. We are sorry that we let you down, that we feast and don't invite others to share with us. We are sorry that we welcome friends, but not always the stranger or anyone who makes us feel uncomfortable. Forgive us, Lord, we pray, and help us to be generous people in our church, in our homes, and in our hearts, making all feel welcome in your love, the same love that offers forgiveness for all that we do wrong through the cross and through the resurrection. Amen. We listen now to our first reading, taken from Psalm 116. Psalm 116 I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Verses 12 and 13 of the psalm we've just heard say, What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. We reflect on those words now as we sing together. What shall we offer our good Lord?
We now hear our Gospel reading set for this Sunday, which is taken from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24 Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. How amazed must the disciples have been when they realized that they were in the presence of the risen Lord. As we ponder our gospel reading for today, we sing together, Jesus stand among us at the meeting of our lives.
We're looking today at one of the most vivid and insightful accounts of the appearance of Jesus after his resurrection. Luke is the only one of the four gospel writers to include this story. It's a story that reveals to us not only something about who we are, but also how Jesus is able to open our eyes to see him for who he is and how we can get to know him better. As we explore the reading in greater detail, I'd like to look at three things that we can apply to our own journey with Jesus, recognising, of course, that this is a journey that will continue far beyond our time on this earth. These things are, as we've already mentioned, allowing God to open our eyes to see his glory, that God can and does put a claim on anyone. And with God, sometimes there is no logical explanation. So let's look first at our first point, allowing God to open our eyes to see his glory. We read in verse 31 of this section of Luke's Gospel that their eyes were opened and they recognised him. This reminds us quite strongly, I believe, of the story in Mark's Gospel when Jesus touched the eyes of a blind man and he exclaimed, I see men walking, but as trees. In other words, I see something, but it's not completely clear, yet. Jesus therefore touched the blind man's eyes again, and by doing so, he cleared his perceptions, he removed his limitations, and he set him free to be the man God intended him to be. I think one of the lessons we can learn from this passage is that we all need a God-given vision in our lives, and without it, we have a tendency of just stumbling through life blinded to who God is and what God is able to accomplish through us. There have been many people throughout history who have had a God-given vision and were therefore able to see things before they became a reality. And they can be great examples for us as we seek to allow God to open our eyes in order to see his glory. One example is Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison saw incandescent light before the first electric light bulb ever glowed. His vision and his ability to allow his eyes to be opened to great possibilities is what sustained him through literally thousands of failed experiments before he finally invented something that would transform the lives of everyone in the world. Another example is Bill Gates. Bill Gates saw a PC, a personal computer, in every office and in every home, whilst the so-called experts were busy announcing, uh, it will never happen in our lifetime. Going back much further in history, we have Moses. Forty years before Israel set foot in the Promised Land, God enabled Moses to see it. The thing is, God can be doing all sorts of things but very often we're unable to see them because we're in the same position as the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Essentially, we experience times when we are spiritually blind. It was only after Jesus had walked with them for seven miles and explained the scriptures to them that we read, their eyes were opened and they recognised him. When we allow God to open our eyes, we begin to see God at work in our own situation. The things that we face each and every day of our lives, our fears become diminished and our faith is strengthened. So how does God reveal himself today? At church? Well, yes, sometimes. But mostly he opens his living word, the word of Holy Scripture and the word who became flesh and lived among us in order that we might have ears to hear and eyes to see. Allowing God to open our eyes to see his glory. Our second point is that God can and does put a claim on anyone. I firmly believe that there really is no such thing as an atheist. I firmly believe that everyone on this earth has an awareness that there just has to be something beyond themselves that they don't fully understand. There simply has to be more. Whether that's a life force, 
nature, or something else entirely, all human beings have an inbuilt desire to explore beyond themselves. Christians, of course, believe that this something other is God. And God, as we're aware, is totally beyond our complete understanding, which is why we worship in faith. A young man by the name of Jack was a militant non-believer. He summed up his view on the world with a verse from the Latin poet and philosopher Lucretius. Had God designed the world, it would not be a world so frail and faulty as we see. So Jack turned his back on any concept of religion and instead turned his attention to academia, where he excelled in each and every field in which he studied. Very soon the dons of Oxford took him in as a respected peer and he began to write and to teach. And yet, far beneath the surface, his doubts were beginning to take hold. He described his mental state with words such as misery and hopelessness. He said, I maintained that God did not exist, but at the same time, I was angry with God for not existing. Eventually, two friends who were also Oxford Dons, John Tolkien and Hugo Dyson, both devout followers of Christ, urged him to do something he'd surprisingly never done, to read the Bible. So he did. Jack began to wrestle with the claims that Christ made, and he eventually concluded that either Jesus was deluded, Jesus was deceptive, or possibly, just possibly, that Jesus really was the one he claimed to be, the very Son of God. On the evening of the 19th of September 1931, Jack and his two friends took a long walk through the Oxford campus. They talked late into the night. And Jack, C.S. Jack Lewis, later told of a rush of wind that caused the first leaf to fall. A sudden breeze, which possibly came to symbolise for him the blowing of the very Holy Spirit of God. Soon after that night in which he walked with his friends, Lewis became a believer and gave his life to Christ. The change in him revolutionised his world and consequently the world of millions of his readers. Could it be that simple? Could the chasm between doubt and faith be spanned with reading the Bible and encountering Christian fellowship? Well, yes, it absolutely could, and it absolutely is. That's why we're called not only to live out our faith in the world, but also to actively encourage those we meet to come and see, to find out for themselves, because God can and does put a claim on anyone. We now come to our final point, that with God, sometimes there is no logical explanation. The disciples had heard the reports from the women who went to the tomb. They had seen the empty tomb for themselves, and yet they still had not believed. They were looking for a logical and a tangible explanation. But what they failed to take into account was that the supernatural working of God to raise Jesus from the dead was totally beyond their limited human understanding. They had never seriously considered who Jesus was and is and will be forever. As we continue to explore the reading that we're looking at today, and as we continue to explore the faith we have in the resurrected Christ, we need to be careful not to make the same mistake. The mistake that discounts what God has done simply because we cannot adequately explain or understand it. While God often uses natural things to accomplish his will, he also sometimes uses things that are mystery, things that we can neither explain or understand. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus knew that something had happened, but it was beyond their level of understanding or their level of faith to see things 
as they truly were. Just because they knew about Jesus doesn't mean they actually knew Jesus. Just because they could see him doesn't mean they could clearly see who he was. A lot of people in the world today know who Jesus is. They've heard about him. Maybe they've read about him. They even use his name. And many do indeed claim that they know him. And yet, most, just like the disciples on the road, would not recognise him if they saw him. Their eyes have not been opened. Knowing about Jesus and really knowing Jesus and having a living relationship with him are two completely different things. Knowing Jesus in our hearts is about trusting by faith when there really is absolutely no logical explanation. There was once a guy named Steve Anderson and when Steve's mother-in-law was diagnosed with cancer, his wife, understandably, wanted to fly out to visit. Steve really wanted to go too, but they were in the middle of a financial crisis and money was really tight. So what did Steve do? Well, he prayed. He prayed hard. And eventually his friend Joe, who, unbeknown to Steve, owned a two-seater plane, offered to fly him. They started their flight in brilliant sunshine, but as they were approaching their destination, they encountered thick fog and were forced to contact the tower for advice. Steve was devastated to learn that, because of the weather, the airport had been closed, so the miracle flight wasn't going to get him to where he needed to be after all. Air traffic control told them that their only course of action was to turn back and try again another day. But that wasn't an option either, as small two-seater planes only have small fuel tanks. And they were running out. They were running desperately low. So what did Steve do? Well, he prayed again. He prayed harder than he'd ever prayed in his life. And eventually he heard a voice say, OK, we're getting the ground crew ready. Come in on emergency landing. As they were making their descent to what they thought was the runway, the controller shouted for them to pull the plane back up. Through a break in the fog, they saw that they were actually over a busy motorway and had very nearly hit a bridge. They weren't approaching the airport runway as they'd thought. Air traffic control then spoke again, saying, listen to me, do everything I tell you to do and I will guide you down. He then calmly issued detailed instructions that enabled the plane to land safely. Joe, the pilot, picked up the radio and thanked the tower for guiding them to safety. He was totally convinced that this amazing guy had quite literally saved their lives. But the controller replied, I'm sorry, but I really don't know what you're talking about. I lost contact with you right after I told you you needed to turn back and try again another day. He also said that everyone in the control tower were totally stunned when they saw the two-seater plane break through the clouds over the runway and come in for an absolutely perfect landing. So if the controller didn't guide them in, who did? At certain times in our lives, there really is no natural or logical explanation. But as we read in Deuteronomy 33, on a spiritual level, God rides across the skies to help us. He carries us in his arms. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 91, God will command his angels to protect you wherever you go. Steve Anderson and his pilot friend Joe agree entirely that God must have sent an angel to bring them in safely. And God has the power to do the same for every single one of us too. Sometimes we just have to believe by faith, as there appears to be absolutely no logical explanation to the way in which God works in our lives. So in summary, 
as we continue to ponder this reading from Luke's Gospel. Let's remember to allow God to open our eyes to see his glory, that God can and does put a claim on anyone he chooses. And with God, sometimes there really is no logical explanation. May God richly bless each one of us as we continue on our journey of life and on our journey of faith, seeking to bring glory and honour to him alone. Amen. The Lord of life has risen indeed, and we celebrate the miracle of the resurrection now as we join together and sing, All you that seek the Lord who died. We now offer our prayers of intercession. Let's pray together. Living Lord, we bring before you now the needs of the world. We pray for those who consider themselves to be strangers and outcasts. Help us always to welcome the stranger, whatever the cost, not sitting comfortably and ignoring people we think don't fit in, not taking the easy way. May our homes and our churches be places of welcome, places of hospitality and also of love, that all may have the chance to recognise and to see you in the warmth of those around them. We pray for countries where food is in short supply. May we farm sustainably and eat sensibly so that there is enough to feed the whole planet May we not look only after ourselves, but seek to offer the same opportunities to all. Help us not to be selfish, but always to consider others. Lord, we long for the day when all in society will be equal. May we be a part of making that happen. We pray for those who are lonely and have no one to eat with them particularly during this time of isolation and social distancing. May we open our doors to our neighbours so that the love and friendship that we experience for ourselves can flourish and all can enjoy the feast. We ask all of these our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. 
and we bring all of our prayers together as we join in the words of the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We bring our time of worship to a close now, as we declare that Jesus Christ is the Saviour of the world and Lord of all. We join our hearts and our voices as we sing, He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Lord Jesus, as you walked on the road to Emmaus, walk with us on the roads we travel. Help us to know your presence with us and to be your presence to others. And at the end of the day, may we all enjoy your feast. And as we enter into this new week, may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each one of us at this most difficult time of staying at home with all those we love and with all those we continue to hold in our hearts and in our prayers, both this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 